Okay, next we're dealing with simultaneous events. That's what we're into now. Uh, what I've done here is taken two spaceships and stacked them end to end. Now, you recall when we're doing our light experiment, if we released a burst of light from here at 12 o'clock noon, the light would reach the opposite end of the spaceship when that clock said 12 o'clock noon plus one second. And uh, in the opposite direction, look at this spaceship here. If you release a burst of light at 12 o'clock midnight, the light would reach the opposite end when that clock said 12 o'clock midnight plus one second. But we'll change it to 12 o'clock noon. And so the light would reach this other clock when the clock said 12 o'clock noon plus one second. So even though this clock is ahead of this one by 0 0.866, and this one is lagging behind the middle clock by 0 0.866, thus the total difference between the two is 1.732. If you have someone at the middle here, Mr. Observer, he would see the two bursts of light, boom, boom, reach him at the exact same time. So if he has mirrors at a 45 degree angle, such that light comes, bounces off the mirror, goes directly to his eyes, and maybe he has binoculars, he would see both flashes simultaneously from his point of view. So even though they're 1.732 seconds apart, by the time the light reaches him in the middle, it reaches him at the exact same time from both ends. That also means, we recall that I said that everything seems to be the same. No matter how fast you're moving, everything seems to be the same. That means if they backed off and were actually at rest in space, so there's no offset between the clocks, again, these would now become absolutely simultaneous events, firing you know, two flashes at the same time and the light reaching the center. But again, even if you start moving across space, even though they're no longer simultaneous, the light will still reach you at the exact same time. So now other people passing by here at different velocities, different than the 260, a variety, let's say, they would all measure the time between the time period, that gap between the flash here and the flash here as different timings, different gaps between. Some almost no gap at all, others, you know, close to uh, 1.732, or if they're actually at rest in space, they would measure the 1.732. But just because everybody's measuring it differently doesn't mean there's no absolute event occurring. The absolute event is this time difference between the two when looking at the big picture. But again, but just because you can't determine whether you're, you're seeing an absolute event or not doesn't mean that no such a thing exists because all these different observers would also measure the length of this as different lengths because their rulers are all of different lengths. But that doesn't necessarily mean there is no absolute length, because they're all measuring something differently. And to measure something differently, you have to have a something to be measuring differently. So in other words, you need the absolute. An absolute has to exist such that you can measure things differently. So again, if you can't determine if something is absolute rest, to say that there's no such thing as absolute rest would be only something said by someone who has a very... Uh, poor IQ, let's put it that way. Okay, so um, again, there's no such thing. It's not everything is just, you know, uh, every, anything but absolute. Everything is just relative. That just doesn't make sense because, again, you're adding uh, so, uh, basically science fiction to science or magic to science. Okay, next we'll go one step further and... Um, go back to the bullets, only this time we're going to convert the bullets into spaceships. At the middle here, we'll convert that into a space station, and these will basically just be um, tracks to send our spaceships down. We don't want to lose these new prototype spaceships, so we just put them on a track, send them down, and then they come back. So here's your original bullet, but we're converting it into a spaceship. And it's going to go all the way down to the end, turn around, and come back to the space station. 
We have another one here as well, which has been converted. Goes all the way down to the end, turns around, comes back. Now, you will recall in the, in the case of the bullet, or the spaceship at rest and firing the bullet, the bullet takes 1.154 seconds to go from one end to the other. And even if the overall spaceship is doing 260, we still recorded 1.154, at least that's what the clocks told us. So that means when, uh, when the bullet goes from here to here, the clocks on board here would tell us that it took 1.154 seconds. Since we're doing a round trip here, here and back, that means that the observers in the middle here would observe a total round trip time period of 1.154 times 2, which equals 2.308 seconds. So this is the time period which would be seen by the observers at the space station. However, again, going back to our bullet and spaceship here, when you send the bullet across, the bullet is moving 260,000 kilometers per second, and if you use a time dilation equation, that tells you that the bullet is moving through time at half speed. That means when you convert that bullet into a spaceship, which has passengers, those passengers would be going across space, or sorry, across time at half speed. And everything seems to be the same here, right? So therefore, from their point of view on board the spaceship, they would experience half of this. In other words, they would experience a total of 1.154 seconds for the round trip. So that would be 0 0.577 seconds in this direction, and a total of 0 0.577 in the other direction. Same over here, 0 0.577, 0 0.577. Now, the spaceships and the tracks are moving at 260, so when this guy, he wants to go 260, right? So what actually happens is he accelerates, or deaccelerates all the way down to zero velocity. Now the space station does all the moving. He stays at rest. So whatever time he would experience is the same as an external observer who's at rest in space as well, would also experience. So the space station moves over a total of 150,000 kilometers and does so at a speed of 260,000 kilometers per second. So we divide 150 by the 260,000 kilometers per second, and that tells that it took a time period of 0 0.577, which is exactly what you would expect. Going in the other direction, though, he's definitely not at rest. If you recall, the speed of the bullet was 297,000 kilometers per second. And if you put that number into your time dilation equation, you end up going through time at one seventh of the maximum speed possible. So that's one seventh. Now, going back to transformation equations, you recall that when the spaceship goes from here to here, any clocks on board, or the clock here, would tell you that it took 1.154 seconds. And the clock offset is 0.866, so you add the clock offset, 0 0.866. That adds up to 2.02. .02. And then, using the transformation equation, you also divide by the square root of 1 minus v squared of c squared. In other words, in this case, therefore, divide by 0 0.5, which equals 4.04 seconds. So from the external observer's point of view, it takes this spaceship 4.04 seconds to go from one end to the other, from the external to the space station. Now, this guy, on the other hand, on board the spaceship is moving through time at one seventh of the speed at which the external observer is moving. So if you take 4.04 .04 divided by 7, that equals 0 0.577. So that's why this guy would experience 0 0.577, because he's moving through time so slowly, not like the external observer who views a total of 4.04 .04 seconds. And so he actually does experience 0.577 in this direction and 0.577 in the other direction, giving you a total of the 1.154.
and so forth, which is half of what this guy would experience. And of course, this guy is moving at 260, so he experiences half of what an external observer would have experienced, which would be two times this, right? Which is roughly 4.62 seconds, which makes sense because to an external observer, this time period is 0 0.5. 0.577. This time period is 4.04. .04. So if you add those two, what you get is your 4.62. Twice this. 4.04 .04 plus the other one gives you the 4.62, which is this times two. So everything, everything works out. So there's nothing uh, mysterious about this. But in the world of physics, they tended to think that everything was just relative for a while there. And so they came up with this thing called the twin paradox. If one twin, let's say, stays on Earth on his spaceship, and the other twin takes his spaceship for a ride, and let's say he makes it up to 260. Anyways, he goes off to a star and then comes back. Well, when everything seems to be relative, when he's moving quickly, it looks like this guy's clocks are ticking slowly. But from his point of view, it looks like this guy's clocks are ticking slowly. So the two should cancel out such that by the time he comes back, they both will have aged an equal amount. But of course, this is not the case. And in my example here, I have triplets that have one, two, and three. One at the space station, one in the spaceship, and another one in the spaceship. And when they take off and come back, you could think of this as going off to a star over here and coming back, while he just stays put where he is. He hasn't accelerated or deaccelerated. And they end up aging half as much as he does. And so forth. So there's nothing... No paradox or anything there. It's quite simple if you're looking at the big picture and understanding exactly what's occurring. But there is another thing here where everything seems to be relative. This guy is accelerating, and so when he does so, he accelerates up to from 260 up to 297,000 kilometers per second. So he gets squished into the chair when you accelerate. But so does this guy, even though he's deaccelerating. You think if he's deaccelerating, he'd fall forward, but notice the spaceship is pointing in the opposite direction. So instead of falling forward, he's being squished into the chair. So it feels like acceleration from his point of view, even though it's deacceleration. So in this case, you can't tell the difference between deacceleration and acceleration. So, you know, so overall, it's a little bit confusing. So when you think of the differences, though, it's quite extraordinary. For instance, if you think of, uh, of uh, all these different directions we're heading in here, let's call those one. It's two and three. Let's say that this one is at rest in space. We'll call him Mr. A. So that'll be this guy. This one's accelerated to 297,000 kilometers per second. So we'll call him B. This one. This guy here we'll call Mr. Ref. A reference. So the point is. If they took off like that and just kept on going, this guy could experience, let's say, one year. While doing so, Mr. A would experience seven years. This one would experience 3.5 years. However, if they went off like that and then came back when they're all lined up again, these two would experience half as much time as Mr. Reference did, assuming we go to our usual speeds of 260 and so forth, right? So even though there's a radically different, a radical difference here, one year, seven years, if they do the round trip, still they end up aging less than the one who stayed put and kept on going in a specific direction. So fascinating.